the introduction. Uh, so thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I think everybody here knows that uh, there was recently a, a fire, unfortunately, at uh, EcoMain's recycling facility when, uh, when the lithium ion battery found its way into our MRF. Um, you know, this outcome was a little bit better than a similar one in December 2017 um, in, in terms of uh, our ability to respond uh, safely and, and so on. Uh, thankfully, no one was hurt in either case, but, uh, you know, rechargeable batteries are a very yeah. real threat to our safety, first and foremost, and our facility as well. Um, and there, there are more and more of them out there every day. So uh, we're fortunate to have a dedicated outreach staff to help share this message. Um, you know, if there is a silver lining to an incident like this, it's uh, it's that it gives us the chance to talk about uh, those very real hazards uh, in that rechargeable battery come through our doors. Uh, so we've done a fair amount of this on social media, through news outlets after the after the incident, uh, particularly over the last month. Um, and without fail, as much as we think uh, we're, we're talking uh, about it all the time, this is always news to somebody out there. So it's important we keep up that message. In our uh, so in light of that, we're happy to have Sean Plass with us from Call to Recycle. Um, to help share some of their insights uh, on battery disposal and messaging so we can learn uh, more about this from uh, the folks who deal with this uh, subject every single day. Uh, a little bit about Sean. He is the Northeast Regional Program Manager uh, for Call to Recycle, which is the country's largest battery recycling program. He manages both corporate and government accounts, assisting with EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, compliance, legislation, safety, and environmental best practices. Before this, he worked in the solar and wind energy industries for Sun Common, which I love that name, <laughs> Tesla, Solar City, and Second Wind. Uh, and he also owned a green building business in Burlington, Vermont, where he still lives. Although I understand it, he's, uh, he's got a few homes and um, his family has a few homes in West Forks, Maine. So uh, that's, uh, that's always great to hear. Uh, Call to Recycle administers over 16,000 collection sites in the United States and Canada, working on behalf of corporate stewards to optimize collections, share experiences and expertise, and responsibly manage the end of life of batteries and other materials. So thank you to Sean, um, and I, uh, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions, but I'll let you take it away for now. Okay, let me share my screen here. Okay, how does that look? Uh -huh. Looks good, Sean. Thanks. Okay, good? Yep. Great. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Matt. Um, this came about, we uh, call to recycle, try to monitor battery safety around the country. And when we saw the fire that had happened at your facility, uh, we were really, really upset about it. Um, reached out to Matt, talked to Kevin Roche, and really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, something we take very seriously, and um, quite frankly, looking at your website and so forth, you all know a lot more about recycling than I do. Uh, the things you're doing with waste to energy, the virtual tours you offer, the educational resources, uh, your EV trucks that will um, run on waste to energy, you're far ahead of me in terms of recycling knowledge and expertise. I hope to offer just something in the battery world to you. Uh, you know, I work on legislation for batteries. I work uh, with a lot of manufacturers and stuff like that. So if I can give you a few nuggets uh, takeaway today, that's, uh, that's my goal. Um, I wanna start off with a quick story here um, that has to do with battery awareness. So a few months ago, I got a call from one of the biggest telecom companies in the country, they've got about 100,000 employees. And I was talking to their compliance director. She said they had a huge problem. Everybody was working at home now because of COVID. And the IT department had to deal with all these laptops that were in people's houses with swollen batteries. There were swollen lithium ion batteries that can combust and you know, catch on fire really quickly. Uh, now, typically when people work in the office building, if they had one of these batteries, they just walk down to the IT department, hand it off and IT would service it. But now those batteries were in people's houses. And she said, how do we get these batteries out of their houses safely? Like, can they open up their computers 
and take the battery out and then drop it at one of your locations? And I said, definitely not. I said, if a screwdriver punctures one of these batteries, you're going to see it burst into flames. So I, so I sent her a, a video. This is a video of a laptop battery being pun punctured with a thumbtack. So that's a laptop battery punctured by a single thumbtack. You can see how it bursts into flames. So if somebody punctured that with a screwdriver or they were driving in their car and it caught on fire. That's what we're dealing with on a consistent basis now in terms of uh, battery safety. Here's another example. This is a FedEx truck in Ohio that was carrying batteries, lithium ion batteries from us and um, it caught on fire and burned to the ground. Now, luckily the driver was safe on that, but that was a huge wake up call for us to have an entire FedEx truck um, burn to the ground. Uh, nobody was injured, um, the driver was safe and people driving by were safe, but it was a close call. Here's another example of a recycling facility in upstate New York last year. Um, they're attributing this to a cell phone fire and the whole facility burned to the ground, it was lost. Um, we take this seriously, number one, for the safety of the people who work there. Um, something we really care about. Number two is the cost of rebuilding these facilities is enormous. And number three, even if you do rebuild it, your insurance, insurance costs go through the roof. Uh, so fire safety in these types of facilities like yours, it's something that we take passionately and, and I'm hoping you do too. It sounds like you folks are way ahead of most facilities in terms of understanding the risk from batteries. So I'm gonna talk quickly about what batteries are. So there's basically two types of batteries we deal with. Primary batteries are one and done. You use them once and, and they're thrown out. Rechargeable means you use them multiple times. You can remember it by the Latin root. So prime means one, like a prime rib is the best cut of steak, uh, re-repeat. So those are the two batteries that we typically discuss, primary and rechargeable. Here's an example of primary batteries we would recycle. You've got alkaline is your typical Duracell, Energizer, copper tops and so forth. And then you got lithium primary. These are becoming more common and these non-rechargeable lithium batteries can also combust. So if you get a greeting card with one of these batteries in it that makes it sing a song when you open it and that goes through a shredder, you're gonna catch all that fire, all that paper on fire. So lithium primary batteries, they grew about 100% in Vermont last year. Um, so I imagine they're going to grow about 100% in uh, Maine. In terms of rechargeable batteries, we've got nickel cadmium, lithium ion, nickel metal hydride, hydride, small steel lead acid, nickel zinc. The ones that we're most concerned about are the lithium ion batteries. So if a tool battery gets crushed, a bulldozer drives over it or it gets into some machinery, it's going to catch on fire as you, as you know well. So there's basically two aspects to batteries right now. One is environmental, environmental management. We don't want batteries like nickel cadmium in the wastewater in soil. So the EPA determines that that's a hazardous waste. On the other side, we've got the safety management and this has to do with Department of Transportation. So they're gonna say that a lithium ion battery is a hazardous material. So batteries play in both the hazardous waste and hazardous material realm. So that's why recycling is so important. We wanna, we wanna take care of both of those aspects. The other thing is called a DDR battery. If you're not familiar with that term, it means damaged, defective, recalled lithium batteries. So that's a term from the Department of Transportation. So it just applies to lithium batteries. In order to ship one of these things, transport them, you need what's called CFR 49 certification. Um, so you have to have that tr certification, you have to use the training, you've got to have the paperwork and so forth. So DDR batteries are gonna become more and more common. You're gonna see them ending up in your recycling bins and so forth. These damaged lithium batteries are really dangerous and they require special permitting and so forth to transport. So that's a quick snapshot on what batteries are. So let's really look at the trends, like what's happening in the battery world. This is a great, um, screens. So this is from The Economist in 2016. It's old, but I like it because it was right. It was forecasting battery growth. So on the left side, these are major manufacturers, Panasonic, LG, Samsung, you know, a lot of those names. 
This is what they're forecast to invest in battery manufacturing over the next three years. And guess what? It happened. The amount of lithium battery manufacturing in the world has grown enormously. So what's the result of that? The cost per kilowatt hour for batteries, lithium batteries, has dropped dramatically. That's this blue line on the right here. You can see in 2008, $1,000 a kilowatt hour. 2020, we're looking at, you know, $100. So the costs have come down because manufacturing has grown. But this red graph I love, this is energy density. So this is like how much power is in a battery for its volume size. You can see it's gone up fourfold in that same time period. So what this means is batteries are getting smaller, but more powerful. And paradoxically, as they get smaller and more powerful, they get bigger and more powerful because a large battery is just small batteries strung together. So if you opened up a Tesla vehicle battery, it's hundreds of small batteries strung together and they look just like a double A, they're called an 18650. So they look like these small double A batteries, but there's just hundreds of them strung together. So as these little tiny batteries get more powerful, the large batteries get bigger and more powerful. So what does all this mean? It means batteries are everywhere. They're incredibly cheap to put in a device and they're becoming more and more powerful, smaller, more powerful, bigger, more powerful. What's also driving this is the internet of things. So these are devices that are connected to the internet. So in 2020, there were 10 billion on earth. By 2025, there'll be 62 billion on earth. So that's a 500% increase in the number of devices that will have batteries in them. And a 400% increase in lithium manufacturing capacity by 2025. So you really have to be aware as a recycling facility, this is coming towards you like a tsunami. You're gonna have a wave of devices and batteries, especially lithium, um, over the next five years. So if you look at your fire risk now and multiply that by 500%, that's kind of the world we're dealing with. So you've got to really think deeply about um, how you're going to approach batteries. It's got to be one of your main priorities as an organization. So what is Internet of Things? It's the Internet of everything. It's the enterprise of things. It's, it's everywhere. And COVID is vastly accelerated this. You've got wearable devices, you've got healthcare, you know, portable insulin pumps, you've got uh, education, how many of our kids are at home now learning on a laptop. You've got agriculture. Um, drones are now being used to survey farms. A lot of farmers are getting drones because it's easier to survey their land quickly and know uh, the moisture content and so forth. You've got transportation. E-bikes are going to hit Maine very quickly in the next couple of years. You've got um, supply chain. Everybody's ordering devices off of Amazon and so forth. So the whole world is going to dramatically trans transform into a battery world in, this, in the next few years. So let's walk you through a day in the life. These are devices that exist now. So let's say it's July and you can fly again and you take a trip, you come back, you land in the airport in Maine and uh, you've got to walk through a hot airport in July. You don't want to carry your suitcase. This is a robot that follows you around. It connects to your phone. So wherever you walk, your suitcase follows you. You don't have to carry it anymore. So you leave the airport, you get in your, your car, you decide to stop at a golf course on the way home to de-stress after a long trip. This is the same thing. This is a golf caddy that follows you around. It's tethered to your phone. So it's an Internet of Thing device. Where you walk, this thing follows. You leave the golf course. You check your phone to see where your dog is. Your dog's got a collar with a battery in it that tracks your phone. You realize your dog's in your neighbor's yard. So you stop, get your dog, put your dog in your car. You head home. You pull in the driveway. Your teenager's shooting hoops. She's got a, a basketball with a battery in it that tethers to her phone. It tracks how many times she dribbles, how many shots she takes, how many miles she runs. While you're standing in the driveway, you notice your lawn needs to be mowed. So you send out your robot lawnmower. This is a lawnmower that has GPS. It memorizes your lawn with artificial intelligence. It mows the lawn for you. You get into your house. Your spouse has bought some steaks, but everybody in the family likes their steak cooked to a different temperature. These are four thermometers that go in all the steaks and it tethers to your phone. It lets you know when each steak has reached its optimal temperature, whether it's rare, medium rare, well done. So you can cook all the steaks for your family uh, with your phone. While you're, while you're cooking your steaks, uh, your phone buzzes and you realize that your baby needs a diaper change. So this is a pod that goes into these diapers. It yeah, tracks hum humidity and lets you know if, if the baby needs to be changed. It also tracks movement, whether the baby's awake, asleep, and so forth. We used to worry about diapers 
because of the waste aspect going to landfills. They don't biodegrade. Now we have to worry about diapers as a fire hazard. So the world is changing quickly and all of this exists now. What's coming in the future is gonna be even crazier. Well, let's look at the good side of batteries. So in 2019, these gentlemen won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for inventing the lithium ion battery. And here's what the Nobel Prize Committee said. It said they have laid the foundation of a wireless, fossil fuel free society and are, and are of the greatest benefit to mankind. So if they had just created the wireless society, that alone would be probably worthy of a Nobel Prize. But here's the key. They've also created the fossil fuel free society that's coming very quickly. Example, e-bikes. They haven't quite hit the recycling market because they're pretty new, so the batteries are still working well, but we're starting to get a lot of calls now to recycle these large batteries. I'll talk more about them later. So e-bikes are going to hit Maine really quickly in the next couple of years, especially in like tourist areas where they want to ride along the coast and rent these bikes, bikes up to tourists. You're going to start seeing these batteries end up in the recycling bins. Here's another example of um, fossil fuel free society. So this is a company in Maine called Beta Technologies. The first plane ever designed from scratch where every part was designed to be an electric airplane. What's amazing about it, it takes off vertically like a helicopter, then it flies at high speeds horizontally, hundreds of miles, and then it lands vertically like a helicopter again. It's made to go from hospital roof to hospital roof for organ transplants so that you don't have to take an organ to a main airport and check through security and all that kind of stuff. This will just go hospital to hospital and um, it recharges in about 40 minutes, so it's all electric. Um, giant lithium ion batteries in this. They had a huge lithium fire um, last year, uh, and then I sold them some uh, products to help contain lithium batteries. So that was a quick snapshot of battery trends. I just want you to understand that um, it's coming towards you really quickly, and you really have to get ahead of that. You have to think strategically on what's coming. A little bit about who we are. So we were the country's first extended producer responsibility program. Uh, we're really proud of that. 25 years ago, the battery industry came together. All the competitors who typically competed said, how can we deal with um, battery waste that's going into landfills and so forth? So they created Call to Recycle. It's funded by battery stewards. We've got about 300 manufacturers and they pay dues based on the amount of batteries they sell into the marketplace. We collect those dues and then run a nationwide um, recycling program. There's other EPR programs now, mattresses, mercury, light bulbs, paint, e-waste, and so forth, but we were the first. We're about 25 years old. Uh, so how the stewards work is that the stewards um, sign an agreement with us. That allows them to put this recycling seal on their batteries and their packaging. Um, and then this gives a number. So we get hundreds of thousands of calls, emails, internet searches, and locators and so forth based on this seal. So this seal is kind of what drives battery recycling nationwide. This is a flow diagram of how we work. So we've got 300 stewards. You'd know most of their names like Energizer, Panasonic, Black & Decker. You know, some of them make tools, some of them make individual batteries, but we got 300 stewards that uh, fund our program. We are a nonprofit. Uh, we use that money to educate consumers on battery recycling. Then we create, uh, we have 16,000 collection sites around the country that collect batteries. Most of them um, you've heard of, like the large retailers would be um, Home Depot, Lowe's, a lot of hardware stores, Staples, Best Buy. Um, then we have a lot of municipal sites and large businesses like Ben & Jerry's. We recycle their batteries in, um, in Vermont. So we've run 16,000 collection sites. We collect those batteries, they get sent to sorters that open the boxes and then sort the batteries by chemistry type and weigh them and track them so that we know exactly how many batteries a Lowe's in Maine ships every year for chemistry type and so forth. So we track all that. The sorters then send those batteries based on chemistry to different processors who actually either dissolve the batteries using acids or they melt them using pyrotechnology or they mechanically grind them up and then separate the metals. So there's different processing based on the chemistry type. But to date, we've done about 150 million pounds of batteries. Last year, we did a record of over 8.2 million uh, batteries during the pandemic, which we were shocked by. But that's how prevalent batteries are. That during one of the greatest uh, recessions and pandemics in our country's history, we actually set the record for uh, battery recycling. 
all these batteries, they're, they're elemental metals. Basically, it's sold back onto the metal, metal exchange. Um, so the lead gets turned into new lead batteries. Some of the steel and metals, so forth, get turned into pots and pans. Um, some of the zinc ends up in fertilizer and sunscreen. So we're trying to create a full circular economy where these batteries get turned into new products. One thing to know about us is we are R2 certified. Um, so Sustainable Electronics Recycling International holds the R2 standards. So we get audited every year. And what that does is basically ensures that none of our batteries are ending up say overseas in a third world country or in the landfills. So everything downstream from us is tracked and audited to ensure that it's the highest standards in the world for battery recycling. Uh, so something we're really proud of, something we take seriously, we go through a grueling audit every year and, and we're willing to do that. We want to do that because uh, we care about it. So that was a snapshot on us. Now I want to show you kind of what we do, like how do we do it? So the first thing we do is returns program. And the objective is simple, to keep batteries out of the waste room so they never end up at your facilities. Like we want to capture them before they get to the waste stream. What does that look like? Well, here's a couple of kits that we sell. Um, we sell these to manufacturers. So uh, laptop manufacturers that have batteries that have um, gone bad, lithium ion batteries, we can sub send these envelopes directly to their customers. So we send out thousands of these every month directly to customers to get their laptops, get their batteries, get them out um, early so they don't end up in the waste stream. So these are used a lot for warranties and recalls. Uh, these can hold laptops, tablets, smartphones, other small devices. Uh, these ones are a bit bigger, these boxes, these are being used more for e-bike batteries and so forth. Uh, but they all have flame-proof liners and they have special permits that we work really hard to acquire through Department of Transportation that if you have a damaged lithium-ion battery, you can put these in, put the batteries in these. You don't need any special training. You don't need any CFR 49 certification. So anybody, any human being in the country can simply put a battery or device in one of these boxes and ship it, UPS, FedEx, and we'll recycle it for you. This is something that you're going to have to be aware of. It's called high watt hour um, batteries because you're going to start to see these soon. When it, there's kind of two types of hazardous materials when it comes to batteries. One is a damaged lithium ion battery. So even a small damaged lithium ion battery by DOT code that needs special protection. You can't just ship that normally if it's damaged. There's another type of battery which is called high watt hour battery. These are lithium ion batteries that are bigger than 300 watt hours. Whether those are damaged or not, they're automatically a hazardous material because they're just so big and powerful that they can uh, catch on fire, they can explode. So a lot of the e-bike batteries, a lot of these lawnmower batteries that are coming, they exceed 300 watt hours. So automatically, whether they're damaged or not, if you see one of these, they require special handling. So the way you calculate 300 watt hours, pretty simple. It's volts times amp hours. So this lithium ion battery here, the lawnmower, it's 80 volts, it's 40 amp hours. You multiply those together, you get 320 watt hours. So that automatically, whether it's damaged or not, is a hazardous material by DOT code. So with our high watt hour box, which my understanding is the first in the market, you don't need any special training certification to ship one of these batteries for recycling. Now you can simply drop it in that box, UPS, FedEx, that kind of a thing and um, you'd be good to go. So we sell these boxes now, but we're trying to get these into the manufacturer's hands. So if they've got a customer who wants to recycle one of these lawnmower batteries, we can just ship this box directly to their customer. So we're really trying to get these boxes to uh, the original equipment manufacturers before they end up in the waste stream. So that was our returns program. Um, I'm gonna get, little bit into what we really do. This is the meat and potatoes of what we do, uh, the recycling program, just so you understand what battery recycling is. So let's start off with the question, why don't people recycle batteries? Uh, we've done research studies, we do them every year, and it's really the same two reasons. Number one, they just don't know what to do with them. Number two, it's inconvenient. Like most people believe in it now, uh, people support it, they want to do it, but they really don't know what to do with them, or it's just too difficult in their minds to get it done. What's the result? If they don't know what to do with them and it's inconvenient, they throw it in the trash or they put it in a blue bin, which um, is what you've seen with your fires at your facility. If someone drops a tool battery in a blue bin, it gets crushed, um, it's a bad day. So that's 
from your perspective, it's from outreach, marketing, and so forth, you got to really just know, educate them on what to do with them. And you got to make it as convenient as possible. And that's what, those are the same two issues we work on. This is a picture from one of your facilities, actually a virtual tour, which I thought kind of fit into what I was trying to say here. Findability and accessibility people, to recycle batteries, they need to know where to take them. So our website, if they Google search, they're gonna find our website. Uh, they type in their zip code, this is our locator. It shows all the closest facilities for them to recycle. Um, it tells what type of batteries they take. It'll show the hours of operation. Are they open on the weekends and so forth? Um, so we work really hard to keep this up to date so that anybody can find a battery recycling place. Right now, 86% of the US population lives within 10 miles of one of our collection sites. So that's something we strive, uh, strive for. There's some rural areas which are still hard to reach, uh, but we continue to work on that every day. These are our boxes. Uh, we've got a patent on the liners for these boxes. We have them specially designed. Um, it's pretty important that you collect batteries in a safe way. So these boxes we ship out to these 16,000 collection sites. The batteries are individually packed and uh, bagged and taped and so forth. They're put in the box, sealed, and then UPS, FedEx takes it away. Um, the shipping is uh, all pre-labeled on these boxes. They're all labeled for mixed battery types. So you can put lithium ion batteries and so forth in here. So these are special boxes that we send out to collect the batteries. They hold about 66 pounds. We have a patent on the liner. This is what happens if a lithium ion battery catches on fire, but so far none of them have breached these boxes. We get a few fires in the boxes every month and um, we track them, we take photos and we document them and so forth. But so far, none of them have uh, breached the box. These are our DDR kits. So I'm gonna talk more about cell block in a minute, but um, if you get a damaged lithium ion battery, you can order one of these kits, you drop it in here, you seal it, FedEx it, UPS it, and it's out of your hands, goes to a recycling facility. So if you're getting these DDR batteries coming in, you gotta dispose of them in a safe way. And if you get a lot of them, you can do bulk kits. So these drums, you fill them up with the cell block material, you can hold 132 pounds of DDR lithium ion batteries, collect them and then send them, send them off. So quickly to talk about protecting your facility and your staff, I wanna talk about what a lithium fire is. There's basically four parts to a lithium fire you gotta be concerned of. Number one is the heat. They burn really hot, really quickly. That's called thermal propagation. So you're looking at about 700 degrees. And if one cell goes, the next cell goes, and the next cell goes, and it, it'll rip through say an e-bike battery really quickly, which will have multiple cells all strung together they'll all catch on fire in a chain reaction. So heat is a big deal. The second thing is they burn with a fuel. That's the lithium electrolyte. That's what's gonna catch on fire. So you gotta find a way to capture the fuel and they're burning oxygen. They're, they're combining with oxygen um, in the air. And as, as this chemistry reacts, they release toxic gases, which uh, you know, can be dangerous for staff to inhale. So, so those, are the, those are the chemical components we're talking about in a lithium fire. This product is cell block. And interestingly, the manufacturer is about 20 minutes from you. Really innovative company in Standish, Maine. Uh, we love working with them. We partnered with them extensively about a year ago. And uh, so we've got a great partnership going and they're kind of leading on this technology. So cell block is made of 100% recycled glass and it's turned into these little granules. And the granules in the manufacturing process are infused with air bubbles, which makes it really light um, but it also creates this uh, amazing effect. When you pour these glass granules onto a lithium fire, the glass melts because of the air bubbles in it. But when it does, it goes from a solid to a liquid, it sucks the heat out of the fire. So it's stopping that thermal propagation from spreading to other cells. The air bubbles in the glass also absorb the fuel. So you're sucking out the electrolyte, the lithium electrolyte and cutting off the fuel source to the fire. And as the glass melts, it encases the battery in a silicon coating and uh, silicate, and it cuts off the oxygen. So you're cutting off heat, fuel, and oxygen to the fire, which is why it extinguishes it. So it's a class D fire extinguisher um, with com for combustible metals, in particular lithium ion battery fires. 
It's also great because it's non-toxic. A lot of facilities used to use uh, vermiculite, which has asbestos in it for containing uh, battery fires, but this is not toxic. It's just glass. It, it's inert and it doesn't actually chemically react with the fire, so it doesn't release toxic vapors. In fact, it's, it absorbs the toxic vapors, those air bubbles in the glass. So you cut off the heat, you cut off the fuel, you cut off the oxygen, you absorb the bad gases. Um, that's what makes it an amazing uh, material. Here is an example of a lithium fire. So on the left, you're gonna see, hang on one second. On the left, you're gonna see uh, vermiculite. On the right, you're gonna see cell block. So imagine you had a DDR battery in your facility that you had to leave overnight. Do you want it in a bucket that has vermiculite on the left or do you want it in a bucket that has cell block on the right? So vermiculite would theoretically contain the fire, but it doesn't extinguish it. Cell block on the right will extinguish that really hot lithium fire. So if you weren't there and your facility had a fire like that during the evening, uh, you want it, the battery stored in a way which will extinguish it. For your facility, we also offer what's called Libic kits, lithium ion battery instant kit. These hang on the wall, kind of like a fire extinguisher or a, um, a uh, like defibrillator, uh, bright colored, easy for the staff to see and find in an emergency. If there's a lithium fire, they can open it up, they can put on these gloves, heat resistant gloves, and if the battery is just smoking, they could pick it up and move it outside or get it out of the way of other, uh, say, paper products and so forth. They then drop one of these ped pads on it. These ped pads have those glass granules in it, so they melt and extinguish the fire. And then there's a fire safety blanket, which is about four feet wide, that they throw over the ped pad to contain any sparks and shrapnel and so forth. So we feel like every facility should have a Libic kit on their walls. People should be trained on what to do if they've got a lithium ion fire um, so that they're always ready. These are cell blocks drums. They're double walled and in that wall is um, the cell block material. So if you are collecting batteries, you can put the batteries in here, add the cell block granules. If there's a fire, those the, the cell block in the wall will absorb the toxic gases. There's a vent in the lid to allow pressure to escape. So you don't have a pressure cooker that's gonna explode. So these are pretty great technology. In Vermont, I've got some sites that are using these for e-waste. If they're getting tablets and cell phones and all these kind of devices that they're gonna to have to hold on to until they're ready to ship, they're storing them in these drums until they're ready to go. And they just add the cell block on top of them to fill them up. And then when they're ready to ship them, they dump out the cell block, collect all the devices and ship them off. This is kind of the Cadillac of, um, of lithium ion containment. This is really more commonly sold to laboratories that are say doing battery research, like that airplane company I talked about in Vermont, they bought one of these. It allows them to store batteries. They can plug them into these plugs and portals and do battery testing overnight. But we are seeing some waste facilities uh, install these just to store batteries, DDR batteries and stuff overnight night as a safe way. It's pretty expensive, $15,000, but um, it definitely protects the facility. So last couple slides I wanna talk about, um, just kind of strategy. You gotta think of battery as a strategy. It's gotta reach the strategy level of the organization. That means the executives are, are planning this strategically and, and developing what I call a battery program. That means if it's a real program, it has a budget. There's an allocated battery budget just dedicated to the battery program for marketing, for outreach, for um, products and so forth. Um, so it, it doesn't become real until it has a budget. You may have to think about redesigning your facility, where are you gonna collect batteries, how are you gonna store them, uh, training for the staff on battery safety, like I'm trying to do today, um, and adding some safety products for battery containment. You also have to have vigilant outreach. It sounds like you're already doing a lot of that and I love it and I encourage it. It should be on the website, newsletter signage perpetually. Uh, we use different um, holidays like Tomorrow is National Battery Day. We're going to do a big campaign for that. Um, you know, in the fall when you've got daylight savings, you can talk about switching out your smoke detector batteries and hey, here's some information on battery recycling. So we kind of follow different cycles on on, on outreach. Because uh, if you don't, 
they're going to throw them in the trash, they're going to throw them in the blue bins. Uh, but you really, you're future proofing your facility for this wave of batteries that's coming. Um, in terms of your organization, if you did want to do battery recycling with us, as a, as a non government agency, unfortunately, you would have to buy the boxes and pay for the shipping to collect batteries. I do think it'd be a great uh, program for you to have because you've got so many sites. And people are, if they're going to, if they don't know what to do with them, they're going to throw them in the blue bin. So we'd love to add you as a collection facility and really get all your facilities involved. Um, there's no cost in the battery, rechargeable battery recycling. Like you would ship those, we'd recycle those totally for free, no cost. That's paid for. If you want to get into primary batteries and non rechargeable, like alkaline and lithium primary, that is a cost um, because they don't actually fund our stewardship program. We just work with rechargeable battery manufacturers primarily. Um, but those are some options for you. Um, you basically be paying for boxes and shipping. It's not very expensive, um, but it'd be, I think it'd be worth it to add that as a pretty robust program and to keep these batteries out of uh, your, your blue bins and so forth. So that um, was my quick presentation. Um, happy to answer any questions anybody has and definitely reach out to me. There's my email. Um, happy to talk. If you have any questions, ping me on LinkedIn. I'm a big LinkedIn person, so I like to stay connected because that's how I learn more about the industry. And um, happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot, Sean. That was uh, very informative and uh, ed educational. Just uh, thank you for grabbing the <laughs> images from all our website. Uh, <laughs> thank you. That's, a, that's always a morale boost. Um, so, uh, I'll, uh, I'll let anybody who might have questions jump in at this point. Um, I've got a couple as well, but, uh, but uh, I've done some talking already. So anybody uh, have anything right off? I do. Um, Sean, thank you. That was really informative. Um, I think, you know, the thing that comes to my mind when thinking about these voluntary programs is the barriers to people participating. And um, what I have seen in terms of going out into communities myself, um, and even in my own life at certain times, um, if there's a financial barrier to doing the right thing, it can really cause people to then choose to do the wrong thing. And so I'm wondering if, because this is a producer responsibility program, um, is there a cost to shipping the boxes themselves? And if there is, why can't the producers of these batteries be charged even more so that anybody can get a box for free and ship it for free? So it eliminates that barrier to people doing the right thing. I think that's an excellent question. That's something, um, that, you know, as a nonprofit that, that we look at too. Um, there's a lot of, how do I put this? There's a lot of movement in the industry right now. I think nationwide people are becoming more aware of this. So I think there's a lot of people that share your sentiments. I certainly do. Um, I've worked on the legislation that just passed in DC. Um, it's the first legislation that was an all battery bill. Um, and, and we, we don't endorse Bills, we, we neither oppose them nor endorse them. So we just try to be technical advisors that if a bill is going to pass, we just want it to be really well written. Um, so we were technical advisor in that. Um, the woman, Rachel Clark, who was down there, did an amazing job. She reached out to the battery manufacturers. She reached out to us. She reached out to Product Stewardship Institute. She really tried to understand it. So, so this bill was crafted, and it would be the, the first bill in the country that would cover both primary bills, rechargeable or re primary batteries, rechargeable batteries, even devices. Um, so that groundswell, I think, is happening where people want to see some, some effort in that. In Canada, they have what's called environmental handling fees. So we're a stewardship program, we're an EPR program where the stewards, the manufacturers basically fund it. In Canada, it's called environmental handling fee, which happens at the retail level. So you go into a store, you buy some batteries on your receipt, it says, you know, two cents environmental handling fee for these, um, for these batteries. And then that runs the recycling up there. So called the Recycle Canada, 
collects these EHF fees. In the US, Calder Cycle Canada collects this, the stewardship fees. Call to Recycle Canada, the recycling rate is almost double what you get in the US. So the EHF fees actually, for whatever reason, seem to, it's hard to compare cultures, maybe Canada is more ahead on recycling in general, you know, but at least uh, it seems to spur recycling of batteries at you know, almost double the rate. So now there's kind of this groundswell in the US, should we have environmental handling fees, but the retailers don't want that. They don't want to have to have that on their receipts where it, it you know, it looks like they're almost taxing the, the the consumer and then the consumers don't really want it. So, so there's kind of this struggle right now. What's the best way to approach this? And I think it's going to start to play out in the next couple of years across the country. But I agree, um, you know, as a nonprofit, you know, we're constrained on, on what we can do and, you know, we can't raise the fees too fast or, you know, we're going to lose stewards. So we're trying to find that delicate balance that makes it as accessible to everybody. Um, and certainly the fire safety issue, I think, is making that more and more prevalent. But um, I know Maine had explored a bill previously. Um, so I think there's, I think there's awareness in Maine that they want to increase battery recycling too. Okay, so that, that then answers my other question, I think, which is that there's no um, obligation in the United States for stewards who produce lithium ion batteries to participate in this program, like paint care, for example, where if you make paint, there's going to be an extra fee added on to every single purchase and that goes towards supporting the plan. Um, yeah, so paint. Yeah, Paint Care has that environmental handling fee and it's worked well. In, in terms of batteries, it's a state by state issue. So like New York State does have that for rechargeable batteries, but not for primary batteries. Vermont, where I live, has it for primary batteries, but not rechargeable batteries. DC is the first to have a bill for both. California is exploring it. Um, so it's really a state by state as opposed to a national. There's talk of a possible national EPR bill, which may be introduced this year. Um, it may pass. I, I think it's going to hit a lot of headwind. I think it's more likely that California will do something first and then that will, you know, as California goes, so goes the country. So I think California is more likely to happen. Um, but there is no national program right now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good questions. Thank you. Hey, Michelle. Question. Um, so Catherine and I were looking a little bit into cell block and I was hoping that you could explain something for me since you know so much about batteries. Um, <laughs> so what happened was the battery was buried like under a lot of other recyclable materials like back by the belt. And I know that they're like small kind of circular balls, but like how effective is that once it's like under a bunch of like flammable materials. Yeah, that's the challenge. You would need to, to dump a whole mound on that. Um, it's, um, that's right. why I was, you know, yeah, when I talked about- we thinking like, um, no, go ahead, sorry. Uh, I was gonna say, that's why I was like when I talked to Kevin Roche because, is that how I say his name, Roche, your CEO? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because he said you guys have the water cannon it's like that's when you've got a giant mound of paper cardboard plastic like that's the level you need um the cell block um is more in like say a battery sorting station or different areas so it's unless you had a lot of it to dump okay. on a, a large pile of paper you could definitely do it so we were but, thinking about um getting a 55 um like gallon drum do you yeah. think that that would be something that would be beneficial a 55 gallon to to say pour on a lithium fire yeah mm -hmm. yeah definitely yeah for sure okay. it, yeah it's because of the air bubbles it's a fairly light material so if you had a couple of people to pour that on there um right yeah i think it it will depend on where the fire is whether the beads spread out and so forth but um if you had that volume of it it was in a small area and you could just cover it it'd be awesome mm -hmm. okay cool that was very helpful thank you yeah Any other questions out there? I've got 
So I've got one, I guess. But uh, um, okay. So my question is um, is about our facility, and you know, uh, you know, if we were to ever be a potential collection uh, point, you know, one of the things I think we we struggle with is the level of, of traffic and, you know, welcoming uh, the public in for things other than tours and our open house and things like that. Um, so how, how would you recommend going about, um, you know, us not being a, a convenience center, so, so to speak, you know, we're, we're more set up to take municipal loads of trash and recyclables um, and less set up to, you know, for John and Jane Q. Smith to come in with their, their load of recycling or, or batteries for that matter. You know, have you seen anybody do that successfully, uh, you know, with a setup like ours? I've seen probably the more common thing is to have events where you have, uh, you know, a, every quarter a battery recycling day and people bring in their batteries and devices and so forth. Because um, if you don't really have a good parking lot or, you know, people aren't, you know, it, it depends on what your setup is where you could actually set up the boxes to, for people to drop off batteries. With COVID, it's become even more challenging because having people come in and out of facilities now, people are trying to remove, remove, move their battery collections outside um, under an awning or a tent, some way that people are out of the elements, you don't want the batteries exposed to the rain and so forth. Um, so those are kind of the options. You could set up a tent or some way for people to just drop by, but I think events are really great. Um, when people see it, see the outreach and say, oh, on this date, I can just bring all the batteries from my house and drop them off. You've got people there to collect them, wearing masks and for COVID and so forth, and it's very controlled. Um, that seems to work well, um, if that's something that you guys would be capable of. Does it, would that work for you guys? I think, yeah, we have a, we have a e-waste collection every year, okay. this year, past year, notwithstanding, um, at our open house every fall. Um, and we try and I think track, you know, what towns are doing e-waste events and, and such um, throughout the year. Obviously we don't hit them all, but, um, but we do try and do that at least once a year. Yep. Yeah, that'd be great if you added the batteries to the e-waste waste. Because um, really that's what it is, people, they're going to hoard them. We call it hoarding. And they'll have, I'm sure you've, I've got a bag of batteries now and you put them in a drawer or a cabinet and you just collect all these batteries and you don't know what to do with them. And then eventually people just, they're cleaning out the garage and they throw it in the trash or the dumpster or whatever. Um, if they don't know what to do with it, but if they know that something's coming up, like I just got to hold on to this till April and then I can take it down. I know this battery event is happening. They'll do it. You know, they'll, they'll hold on to those batteries and then they'll drop them off. Um, so just getting that in their minds that something's coming, will they'll plan for it. Sean, this is Mark. You said though the big box stores offer it for the rechargeable um, tool batteries, those sort of thing, free of charge. So is there any way, Matt, we could you know leverage that on our web page at, at the as an interim option, so so we aren't getting them mixed in with the trash? Yeah, so we, we try and do that via the web um, on our uh, a couple of our disposal pages. You know, for example, in the Recyclopedia, if you look uh, if you look up batteries, there's a, a link to the call to recycle locator um, with you know the, the store listing. Um, same thing for you know there's a specific link for battery um, a battery disposal uh, and that links right to the, the locator as well um, you know the, I think there's definitely always more we can uh, we can do and point people to those those resources though for sure do we have call to recycle linked cross-linked on our web page we do yeah, good yeah I think creating like an annual battery outreach cycle is you know something to consider you know just once a month or periodically sending people you know, to Lowe's or whatever it is, just to constantly have that in the consumer's mind. Because to me, I don't know a lot about recycling other products, but I see this as like one of the most important issues in the entire recycling industry is gonna be batteries. And it's gotta be something that's really annually planned on, on how to address it. 
I saw that Vanessa posted a chat question. Have there been efforts to also include primary batteries in the call to recycle program? If I recall, the, they've been free riders in these collection recycling programs in the past. Good question. So we would love to get more into primary batteries, especially the lithium primary batteries. They're pretty expensive to recycle. Um, so an alkaline battery is about 40 cents a pound to recycle. Lithium primary, which are a lot of these little button cells and coin cells and so forth, they're like $3.75 a pound. Uh, so it's, it's challenging to recycle those. Um, and because they're not part of the stewardship program, we have to charge for that. Um, in Vermont, it's free for anyone to recycle those batteries. So Vermonters recycle the most batteries per capita in the nation because it's totally free. They can drop off rechargeable batteries under our voluntary program, or they can drop off primary batteries under the legislative program. So Vermonters are unique in that. DC will have the same. Um, so DC and Vermont will have a free primary there's some individual places that do this, like individual sites will just pay us to, to take their primary batteries. California has a lot of that stuff. Um, so it's becoming more common, but it's not on a national level yet. Lisa. Um, so another question I had is, you know, obviously for us, our, our largest concern is when these batteries end up in the MRF and then cause fires um, yeah. in amongst the recycling. Um, and I think that those fires around the country are pretty well publicized. What do you know about and is it tracked um, if these batteries are causing fires in landfills? And um, if, if I don't feel like I've ever heard of, you know, a landfill fire being tied to a lithium ion battery, but I can't imagine that that isn't happening. Um, what do you know about that? It's, it's, it's this funny <laughs> debate. It's an excellent question. So there's two schools. One says that the fires are overreported, that it's kind of like any fire now is blamed on a lithium battery. The problem is the batteries are, the fires are usually so hot, they burn everything. There was a facility in New Jersey, which was tragic just a couple weeks ago, a $15 million facility just burn to the ground. 22 fire departments reported. Uh, a couple firemen were injured. It was sub-zero temperatures and it was the worst conditions, but it was so hot it melted the steel, the steel girders of the whole thing. Um, was that a recycling facility? Yeah, it was a recycling facility. Um, thankfully, uh, none of the staff were injured, but I think it was like 200 jobs lost um, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, but trying to find a battery in the middle of something that's so hot that it melts steel is, you know, probably impossible. Uh, whether it was battery, you know, there's a lot of propane tanks and different things that are also causing fires, so like the little camping propane tanks get thrown in recycling bins and so forth. So there's some people say, well, everything's blamed on lithium batteries, and so it's being overreported. Another school says actually it's underreported because uh, facilities don't want their insurance costs to go up, so they're trying to not report the fires. Um, so there's no national statistic tracking of this. Like it's really not standardized. It's hard for us to figure out when a fire happens. We try and tr check and, and stay on top of um, what's reported in the media and then reach out like, you know, talking to Kevin, Kevin had some great insights. He said, um, he said he's more worried about recycling than trash because household trash has food in it. It's got wet materials in it so it's less likely to catch on fire whereas recycling blue bin it's paper cardboard plastic like and I thought I'd never heard anybody say that insight before uh, I thought it was really cool that he said that um, and, I, and I've talked to the execs about that I'm like can we study whether these are happening in trash versus recycling centers you know that would be useful knowledge if we could track that statistic so we're we've got a new CEO Leo Rodis he came over from Microsoft. He was doing the sustainability with those folks on a global scale. Um, he's really passionate about this. And so we're trying to look at a statistical model, some way to track all this on a, on a bigger scale, more formalized. So it's a great question. Um, right now, there's no leading statistical organization that has this information. Thank you.
All right, we've got about five, four minutes left. Um, any other questions kicking around out there? Going once, going twice. <laughs> Well, if not, uh, Sean, I want to thank you again. Uh, this has been really, really informational and, and fun chatting. Um, so I want to thank you and, and call to recycle for doing this uh, and for keeping an eye on uh, keeping an eye on the news up here in, in Maine. And uh, maybe sometime we'll see you kicking around the forks. <laughs> I'll be there as soon as COVID is uh, <laughs> is waning. We'll be up there fly fishing in no time. But yeah, I love Maine. Uh, love everything you folks are doing. Um, very upset about the fire, and uh, you know I'd love to partner in any way we can just to to keep you guys safe and and, and help with the the residents of Maine. You know, educate them and so forth. So definitely, let's let's keep it going. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you again, and uh, we'll certainly be in touch. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay.